Praise God. Amen. God is good, amen? Amen. amen? Yeah, powerful words of forgiveness. Yeah. And uh, today is a day when we can celebrate and rejoice in the fact that you and I have been forgiven. Yeah. Praise God. And uh, the crucifixion really is all about God bringing to fulfillment the plans he had right at the beginning of creation. It was a long time coming. A lot of things went through the process of history. But never, God never forgot his plan. No. God. The blueprint yeah. never changed. The plans were drawn. You were meant to be here today. The plan is that during this time of all those thousands of years God intended to redeem mankind back to himself. That was his plan. When God created all things, he said in Genesis, I'm louder than everybody else, so thank you, dear. God said in Genesis, right at the beginning, that he intended to create all things good. And he, when he'd finished, it says, and when he'd finished, it was good. In fact, it was very good, he said. Hallelujah. That's an understatement, I'm sure. And so God had created all these things. Created the earth and everything that is in it. Yeah. And God's eternal plan was that you and I, mankind, yeah. would have a complete connection and relationship with God. Amen. And that's how it started, right at the beginning. Yeah. Because God would come into the cool, in the cool of the evening, into the garden, and he would come to spend time with Adam and Eve. Is that not right? Is that what it says in the book? He came and sat amongst them. He came and communed with them. He had conversation with them. This is Almighty God, the creator of the universe. And he's coming to his creation because he adores his creation. And he comes to speak with them. Yeah. And then we know that as we read that story further on, that sin comes in, they sin, they make a mistake, a big mistake, and God has to do something about it. Because, you see, God cannot allow sin into his presence. Yeah. Because if sin comes into his presence, it will be destroyed. And so here we, we read in Genesis chapter 3 and it talks here in that and I'm not going to read it today because I'm sure time won't allow for everything. But verse 8 of chapter 3 says and they heard, this is Adam and Eve, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day, in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of of God amongst the trees in the garden. So many people today are hiding themselves from God. Yeah. They're hiding themselves in riches, finance, success. They're hiding themselves in drink and drugs and all these things that are going on that God totally disagrees with, that says, this is not the way forward. This is not what I created you for. I created you for greater things. Amen. Amen. 
And so men and women are hiding themselves in all of these things, so that in all of these things, in the noise of all of these things, they hope to forget God. They hope that they'll not hear the rustling of God walking in the garden. They hope not to hear the footsteps of God coming towards them with all this noise going on in their lives. And in those few verses, from verse 8 through to verse 21, he talks how the Lord spoke to them, told them how they had caused a curse to come upon themselves and upon all of creation. You see, all of creation was pure. It was sinless and spotless, but the moment they sinned, they tainted everything. Everything that they touched suffered the punishment of sin. And Satan, the enemy, the serpent, put enmity, put a division between Adam and Eve and God. And he even said to the woman, you know, you will have great trouble in childbirth. You will bring children forth with pain. And I know you ladies know something about that. In verse 17, the ground was cursed. And Adam was told that you'll toil. If you've ever had a big garden, man alive. We have a big garden. It's clay soil. Even worse. Times I've dug that and dug all the weeds up and put plants in and started again and gone back and there the weeds are growing faster than everything else. And I'm thinking, Adam, this is your fault. My back would not ache as much as this if it weren't for you. But then again, if I'd been the first Adam, would I have made the same mistake? Thank you, dear. <coughs> there you go. Great when you've got the support of your wife, isn't it? You know, revealing the every weakness about yourself to everybody else. Thank you, dear. Praise God. I love you in spite of it all. <clears throat> Got to do after 40, what, 50 odd years now. I nearly, no, I, yeah, I'm trying to think. I've been saved 50 odd years and we've been married 50, just 51 years coming up this year. Wow. Where do all those, those numbers come from? Hmm? Where did all those years disappear to? I can remember when I was riding a, a 350 Triumph motorcycle and Grace was getting on the back. We were just dating in those days. You know, I can remember those days like, where did those 52 years go? Whew. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it seems to be. But thank God, God has eternity for each and every one of us to that know Christ and to know his life eternal. And so the ground is cursed so Adam toils. <clears throat> and you know it was at this time that God had to bring a sacrifice for Adam and Eve. Take a note of that, right at the beginning, the first sacrifice for sin. God's plan, God is revealing his plan. God is revealing what's going to be happening 2,000 years later. The devil never sees it. And God sacrifices a lamb that Adam and Eve's sin would be covered not removed 
covered. And that was the process that for the next 6,000 years, sin was only covered by the sacrifice of the blood of a pure and spotless lamb. But you know, when Jesus died on that cross, he was that perfect lamb of God. He was the one who was perfect. He was sinless. He was spotless. And he there was that perfect lamb. And he sacrificed. He gave himself over to the punishment of sin. He took my punishment. He took your punishment upon himself. He, put your, he took your waywardness. He took your foolishness that caused you to sin, that causes us to sin. And he brought us to a place of absolute and total forgiveness in God. Amen. And I just want to encourage you to realize that God, God is a God of love. That's why we have behind me on, that, up on the top, God is love. He hates sin, but he loves the sinner. Some people try and tell us, oh, God hates me because I'm a sinner. No, God does not hate you because you are a sinner. God hates the sins that you do. And that is a big difference. God's love today is constantly reaching out to each and every one of us. Because if God hated us, he would kill us. He would wipe us out. But it is because of the precious blood of Jesus that one perfect sacrifice which has removed the curse of the sin on us. Amen. One day if we don't take Jesus, if we don't accept Jesus and change our lives to follow him, then there will be a judgment day. God wants you to be free from bondage. Amen. Jesus came to set the captives free. You know, the children of Israel, when they were slaves for 400 years, can you imagine that? A slave to Pharaoh, to have to make bricks, with basically just about no materials in the end. Being beaten and whipped, starved. And after 400 years, Moses, who was prophesied, comes along. And he brings them that release and that deliverance. But you know, for that release and that protection and that deliverance to fully happen there was a Passover lamb that had to be sacrificed and each family had to sacrifice a Passover lamb, a perfect lamb. And as that lamb was sacrificed, its blood was sprinkled on the doorpost and on the lintel so that when the angel of death moved through the land of Egypt, when he saw the blood, the angel passed over. And all those that were in that house were safe and saved, and were able to go over for the promised land. Yes. Hallelujah. I thank God for my Passover lamb, Jesus. Because if it wasn't for that Passover lamb, Jesus, today I could be dead. At least three times I could have been killed. But I'm still here. And do you know why that is? I'm here to, to irritate you. No, I'm not. <clears throat> I am here because there is a work for Jesus that I must do. Amen. And whilst there is a work, and whilst I am busy at that work, Amen. then I'm going to be sticking around for a while. Yes. Hallelujah. And hopefully I might be that little bit of grit that's in that oyster that brings a pearl. So maybe, you know, you guys will just suddenly become pearls as I just irritate you along on my journey. Praise God. Is that right? Yeah. He's like that. 
So, uh, you know, if I hear you say, oh, Andrew's been irritating today, oh, praise God for that. You know, I must be doing something right. You know, He's got underneath my skin. Praise God, that's wonderful. Glory to God. I pray that the Spirit of God would use me to get underneath your skin, get into your spirit, get into your heart, and begin to stir you and to move you to be a one who is going to do great and mighty things for God. Because I believe it. It's not about how talented you are. It's about how available you are. Amen. Amen. He's got all the talent that you need. He'll give you the words to speak. All you have to do is spend time in his presence. And when you spend time in his presence, he will then give you the words to speak whenever you're out and about doing whatever you're doing. But first, we must spend time in his presence. And as we spend time in his presence, the Holy Spirit just fills us and fills us and fills us with himself. The presence of God to flow out of us. And so that Passover of in Egypt was again, was just a reminder, I have a plan. I have a plan for all of humanity. But the time is not quite yet. But I do have a plan. Glory to God. You know, in Deuteronomy, in chapter 16, it talks, and uh, the first verse, it says, Observe the month of new corn, and keep pasture for the Lord your God. For in the month of the new corn, he brought you out of Egypt by night. What that tells us is that the month of the new corn is the month of new beginnings. You know, when we surrender our life to Jesus, it starts the new beginnings. The past is gone. Our weaknesses, our failures, our sins, all that we've ever done wrong are gone. As far as God's concerned, no more to be remembered by him. Because they are removed, not covered. They are removed by the blood of Jesus. There's the difference. See, Jesus came to remove sin, to pay the price for sin, so that on my account, all my sins, Jesus said, written across and signed it in his blood, Paid in full. My debt, my debt of sin has been paid through the blood of Jesus Christ. And as long as I continue to follow him, my debt is paid. And I stay in that relationship because, not because of the debt that's been paid, but because of my love for him, because of his love for me. It's a two way street. And I love this because when you start reading the Bible, when you, and whatever you do, do not not read the Old Testament. I'll say that again just in case you didn't get that. Do not not read the Old Testament. Because I know these days at Bible college, they spend a load of time in the New Testament and they tend to forget about the Old Testament. Oh, it's Old Testament. That don't really matter, does it? Well, the Old Testament are types and shadows of that which is to come. Amen. And in here, even in this chapter in Deuteronomy chapter 16, in verse 9, it talks about the Feast of Weeks, and you shall count seven complete weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain, then you shall keep the feast of weeks for the Lord your God. That seven weeks, if you look at that, seven, how, many, how many days are in a week? Seven. seven. That's, pardon? 
No. Seven sevens? 49. Seven sevens, 49. It was 50 days to the day of Pentecost after Christ had risen. Even in Deuteronomy, thousands of years before, God is saying through Moses, his prophet, this is what you've got to do and count 49 days. And on that 50th day, harvest, an outpouring. 50 is a, a number for the year of Jubilee. Amen. God's got a Jubilee for you. I say God's got a Jubilee for you. God has got a Jubilee. Hallelujah. Debt's cancelled. Everything's removed. God has got a jubilee for each and every one of us. Hallelujah. And you know, the jubilee was at the day of Pentecost when there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples. And they were endued with power. And they went out into the marketplace. And it says, and 3,000 souls were saved. Talk about putting in the sickle and bringing in the harvest, the first fruits of the harvest. That is what resurrection life is all about. Hallelujah. Amen. This is why Jesus died. And every time I come in here and every time I pray, I, I pray for this filling. I pray that each and every one of you that is here now will catch an, an enthusiasm and a fire yes. that causes you to I have such a passion for the gospel and to share the life of Jesus with so many others. And I pray that each and every one of you will catch something of the Spirit of God and that you will begin to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Amen. That even as the disciples, when Peter was walking to the temple, even the shadow, it says, of his body that went over the sick, they were healed right there and then. Come on, bring on the shadows. Not them, you know, not them shadows from the 1960s. <clears throat> just, that was just for Robert's case, because, you know, I, I know he gets a bit confused. But, okay. You hear what I'm saying? Bring on the shadow. Bring on that powerful anointing of the presence of God. It is for the church today, because... Hebrews says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changeth not. And so today we have to realize that the church needs to line up with the Word of God. The church needs to line up with Jesus. The church needs to line up and begin to do the signs, wonders, and miracles. Don't just stand around having a happy, clappy time with smoke machines and flashing lights. That's not church. That's having a happy, clappy time. That's just tickling your emotions. Oh, weren't it great at church, you know? <laughs> I'm absolutely jiggered, you know. I fell asleep when he preaching because I, I jumped up and down that much and I have no idea what he preached on. Hello? Hey, you might be laughing, but I'm telling you that's it. I'm too tired to listen to a preacher. I fell asleep. That's what's happening. Church, arise. And let your enemies be scattered. You can keep your flashing lights and smoke machines because the only flashing lights and smoke machines I want to see is around the throne of God in Revelation. That's where the flashing lights are. That's where the smoke machine is. What are we trying to do? Bring, it, bring heaven down on earth? We're bringing the wrong bits down. 
We need to bring the presence of Almighty God. We need to let the Holy Spirit move through us in power, changing and touching lives, healing the sick, raising the dead and casting out demons. That's what the cross is all about. That's what the cross is there for. It's about multiplying. That each time every one of you wake up, the devil says, oh no, another little Jesus has just got up. I'm afraid. Because every time they wake up, there's another little Jesus awake, ready to go and do the work of the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Don't go quiet on me. Thank you. Praise God. Otherwise I'll shout for myself and it'll take me twice as long. I'll preach, I'll either preach you to sleep or preach you awake, one of the two. Glory to Jesus. You got all day, have you? Well, it's happened before now. I've preached what, from 7 till 11. Hallelujah. And that was at night. I had to throw them out in the end. When the Lord moves. When the Lord moves and people are hungry for the things of God, when things will move and change. We haven't yet got to the crucifixion. We're just winding up towards it. We're just looking at God's preparation, telling us about what is going to happen. You know, we, we read, we read on, uh, on Friday, didn't we? Where it talks in... Uh, Isaiah. Isaiah wrote in chapter 53. He's writing 800 years before Jesus has even been born. And he's telling us, what is he telling us there? He, Isaiah, by his stripes, Hey, shall we be healed? Do you know something? When Isaiah is writing this, the, the method of crucifixion was not even invented. Crucifixion only came in with the Romans, with the Roman Empire. 53. And verse 4, surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and the chastisement of our well-being fell upon him and by his scourgings we are healed. 800 years. 2,800 years before you were born. Makes you, you know, you, you start to think, really? 2,800 years approximately before you were born, Isaiah is prophesying the death of the Lamb of God upon the cross. It's astounding. And then if you move on to Zechariah in the Old Testament, chapter 12, of Zechariah. Again, 500 years before Jesus was born. And verse 10, 12, 12. You got it? Chapter 12, verse 10. 
And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look unto me whom they have pierced. Jesus. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And they shall be bitterness for him as one that is bitter for his firstborn. This is a minor prophet. <laughs> and he's saying 500 years before the event, you're going to pierce my son. You're going to pierce my firstborn. This, the crucifixion, the Easter time, is not an accident looking for somewhere and sometime to happen. It was planned. It was planned. It was in the original blueprint because God knew. God knows all things. So why are you worried? Why are you fretting about your future? God knows all things. And God has a plan and a purpose for you. We need to ensure that we are walking in his perfect plan for our life. And as we walk in that perfect plan, God says, I will supply all your needs according to my riches in glory through Christ Jesus. It comes through Christ. It comes through the cross. It comes through that relationship that we have with Jesus. People have said to me, oh, Andrew, you're, you're an idealist. You're a perfectionist. Yes, I am. Do you know why? I take after my father, and that I don't mean my earthly father, I mean my heavenly father. Because when God made all things in the beginning, he said, he looked at it and said, it is good, in fact, it is very good. It's perfect. So, guess what? God's an idealist. God is a perfectionist. I want to take after my father. I want to be an idealist. I want to be a perfectionist because that is who my father is. And my father wants me to be a chip off the old block, as they say. Hallelujah. Do you want to be a chip off the old block? And I'm not being disrespectful to God. Because God wants you to be like him. God made you in the very beginning in his very image. You know, though, that word in his very image, it's a, it's a very, it's five letters. But it's, it's more than five letters. In those few letters, there's an enormity that God wants to get over to you. To be like him. We used to sing a song, didn't we, David? To be like Jesus. Here's the my song in the home and in the throne. To be like Jesus all the day long. Oh, to be like Jesus. You know, some of these old songs, there were, there's, there's something in them. These, these men and women were, were seeking the presence of God. Because you see, without the presence, there's no power. Without the presence of God, there's no authority. Without the presence of God, we have nothing. We just attend a meeting. It can be anything. You know, you can come along, we just have a happy clappy time, you know. Have a cup of tea and a cream bun and go home. 
Well, if that's all you come for, you come to the wrong place. God is looking for people to become vessels of honor, to become vessels of power, to become, be, to become suppliers of the presence and power of God through their lives. God wants you to be a cable, a conductor of the presence of God. So that when you come into contact with somebody, you touch them with the presence of God. Don't get too excited about that, you know. I've seen it happen. Not the excitement, but the presence of God. And when you touch people with the presence of God, lives are changed. Lives are changed. And they start asking you dumb questions like, what is it that you've got? There's something about you that's different. What is it? Jesus. Jesus. That's what is different about us. I don't want to be known as a church attender. I don't want to be known just as a a minister of a church. I want to be known as a son of God. I want to be known as somebody who's walking in the presence and the power of God. And that if you have a need, then Jesus will come and touch you. That I'm going to be one of those conductors of the very presence and the very awesome power of God. Peter was. Twelve disciples and the other disciples, they were all conductors of the presence and power of God. You see, you read the book of Acts. If you want to get inspired and encouraged, read Acts this month. Be stirred by it. Because Jesus is risen. And you know, he gave his disciples... We haven't even got to the crucifixion, have we yet? We know it's happened. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You see, there's so much about this story for me. I mean, I could be up here for a long time. Just, you know, might have to get kettle on at Biscuit's house and, uh, you know, Oh, no, no, we'll just, we'll just carry on. No, no breaks, no breaks, no breaks. This story, it's a true story, by the way. It's not fictional. It's not Hollywood. Okay? The problem today is they see films and they say, wow, did you see that? Nowhere near the story. The last biggest mess up that Hollywood made was that I remember was the story of Noah's Ark. I watched it because I thought, well, I'll see how far away it is. It was so far away that the guy who ever did it and wrote it and filmed it had never read a Bible in the whole of his life. And then people watch it and then people turn around and say, well, this is how it happened. No, 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 no. Read the book. Go to the source. If you want to know the truth, go to the source, not the one who's telling it for the 500th time from somebody else. You know the old story? Somebody's on the front and they're battling away and said, Send a message back to base. Send reinforcements. We are going to advance. By the time it gets to base, it comes out like this. Send three and four pence. We're going to a dance. 
That's because they didn't get it from the direct source. It went through a load of others until it becomes twisted. And so now we want three and fourpence and we're going to go to a dance. It was a true story, is it? Oh, well, I didn't know that, but I've heard it a number of times said and I've used it. So, we the church need to hear the voice of the Spirit. We the church may need to make sure it lines up with this book. Because the next question could be, which spirit are you listening to? Ooh. Ooh. Now that gets under some people's skin, but hey, that, that's the truth. I've had people tell me, I heard from God. He told me to divorce my wife and go and marry this other woman. I'm not just, I've heard it more than once. Exactly, which God are we listening to? This God? You might laugh and think, no, it does happen. It does happen. In fact, they're not here, but they've been here. And they once said that to Grace and I. And I said, oh, no. No, no, no. That is not what God said. They didn't do it, but hey, you know, they were going to. It's like, no, 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 no. Come on. Don't use the word of God and twist it for your own ends. Keep it pure. Keep it right. Keep it holy. And I tell you what, God will do great and mighty things. This pure word of God is for you and for me. It is for the world. It changes lives. One thing I want to bring out from the cross, just to emphasize on this, and I spoke about it on Friday, and it was from Matthew chapter 27 and verse 23 onwards. Then the governor said, why, what evil has he done? But they all cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that the tumult was rising up, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude and said, I am, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered, said, his blood be upon our head and upon us and upon our children. Then he released Barabbas, a thief, to them and went and scourged Jesus and delivered him to be crucified. Verse 27. Then, Jesus, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him, and they stripped him and poured a, put a scarlet robe upon him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed down the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. You know, as Jesus was being crucified, as they hammered the nails into his hands, Jesus was saying, Father, Forgive them. As they hammered the nails to his feet, he said, Father, forgive them. As they tied his arms to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He never uttered a word against them. He never cursed them. He never blasphemed them. 
all he could say was, forgive them. His blood is the blood of forgiveness. Amen. His blood is the healing and redeeming blood. His blood is the one who sets captives free. If we're in bondage to sin, his blood, the name of Jesus, sets the captives free. He was crucified. He was broken. But yet he continued to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. All this pain, all this suffering was for you and for me. He took the mental torture. It says he sweat drops of blood. That was symbolic for mental conditions. He says by his stripes we were healed. He received 39 stripes. They weren't just a whip. It was a whip with nails and bone and everything on it that was that dug into the flesh and tore flesh out. Even Pilate, when he saw what the soldiers had done to Jesus, was ashamed of them. He didn't intend that to happen. But 800 years ago, God intended that Jesus would be scourged. The perfect Lamb of God would be scourged for my sin, for my iniquity, for everything that I've ever done and said wrong. Jesus took it that I might not have to suffer Amen. Amen. separation from eternal God. God. He took it that I might enter into the very presence of the living God and that I might see a lamb who was risen, who has nail prints in his hands, whose face has been marred, whose body's been marred, that carries my name on him. And he looks at me and he says, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. That's what Easter is about. It's not about Easter eggs and bunny rabbits. It's about a man who died on a cross, who took your punishment, who took my punishment, who paid the price to set you free. It's about a man who had done nothing wrong. It's about a man who only did good. It's about a man who raised dead people, who opened blind eyes, set captives free, opened deaf ears. It's about that man. He fed 5,000 people. It's about a man. But that man was God's son. And that man, God's son, died for you and for me. That in his death, I might have eternal life. And today we celebrate that he, Jesus, the Son of God, is risen. He's ascended and he's glorified. And he's there, it says in heaven, interceding on your behalf. He's pleading your case. He's pleading your cause. And he's calling your name. And if you've never asked Jesus into your heart and life, if you've never given Jesus an opportunity, then today, I ask you today to give him that opportunity, to surrender your life to him, to give him an opportunity to give you a new life, a new way, a new hope, a new future. And for anybody that's watching this video today, make this your day. Make this your opportunity. Don't go and close down 
But take Jesus today as your Lord and Savior. Surrender to him. Give him everything. And I'll tell you what, you'll never regret a moment of that. Because he will give back to you, pressed down, shaken together and running over. God will give into your life. And you will find life in a changing way. You will find a new life in Christ Jesus today. Surrender to Jesus. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Father, I just pray that if there's anybody here, anybody watching, who has never given their hearts and lives to Jesus, then I pray, Lord, that they will pray, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy to come into your presence. But because of the sacrifice of your son Jesus because of his shed blood I can receive my sins forgiven Father I'm a sinner forgive me of my sins Lord Jesus come into my life and cleanse me and heal me and make me new. Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my life. And Lord, I surrender all to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you've given your heart and life to Jesus, wherever you are, please speak to someone, another Christian. And if you're watching over the internet, find a church, find a good church that speaks about the love of God and the power of God. And join that church. And become a, de- a real disciple of the Lord Jesus. A disciple means to be a disciplined follower of the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Begin to just walk that walk and be a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you.